Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. I'm Ken Hamilton. And we're going to talk this week again about, well, ethical non-monogamy and open relating. I didn't think we were going to be cycling back to this topic quite so soon. We just did a little series on um, consensual non-monogamies earlier this year. But I got a bunch of questions afterwards about wait a minute, what was that you were talking about? And how does it look and how does it work? And so I wanted to circle back and just dive into the topic a little bit more. Yeah, I thought it would be fun to, doesn't have to get deep or... Yeah, we can stay in the fun part of yeah, it. You can stay in the fun part, that's what I'm So saying. let me just preface this by saying monogamy works for lots of people. Monogamy, meaning that people are making a commitment to fidelity of sexual behavior, romantic behavior, emotional behavior, however you want to define your monogamy, that's between you and your partner. I have, I have no preference for open relating personally over monogamy. What I have is a commitment to the idea that we should think about our love style. We should, we should actually consider what our love style is, what feels right to us and what works for us in our life. And think about what it means to us so that we can consciously design our relationships to work for us <laughs> rather than just follow the script. Yeah. So if if the script, if the, the dominant cultural story works for you, no shade, that's, that's great, do it. But if it doesn't, then... I also want you to feel included in the larger conversation of relationships. And I want there to be more dialogue back and forth between people who do relationships and do love styles differently, because I really feel like there's so much we can learn there's from each other. There's a lot to learn from each other, yeah. About how we do relationships. And um, open relating is, it is becoming more and more common to hear about it, but I still get questions that I think, oh, goodness, I didn't realize that 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 wasn't obvious. So let's answer a few of those questions yeah. that I've gotten over the last couple of weeks. And I have lots of questions myself. I mean, you have studied this academically as well as, you know, in your own life. And I I haven't studied academically. I've, I've barely read anything about it even. I just sort of have my experience and, and let that kind of drive me. But you have started many conversations with me about what I'm, what I'm actually thinking and what I'm doing. And it's, it's, yeah, it's evident. We approach our lives in very different ways. I am an explorer by nature. I go out and I poke at things to see what happens. And you tend to, I tend to walk along hoping to whatever that it's all going to work out. Well, based you, on what I already think. You're much better at being in the moment than I am. Yeah. You are yep. so much better. I live a lot of my life in the past and the future, and I work on that all the time. Um, and you tend to stay in the moment, which is awesome. And you ground me really well because of that. But I will just poke at concepts just to find out what they're like. So I've explored the different types of, the, the different options that there are in open relating. Um, I've done it academically, like you said, but also from the coaching perspective, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm very well educated in what are the options so that people can think about their relationships and custom design them because that matters to me. I want everyone to feel empowered to create their relationship the way it works best for them, which includes consciously designing your monogamy, however you want it yeah. to look. Um, uh, Dr. Tammy Nelson writes about that. Uh, she has a great book called The New Monogamy, which I think really speaks to the heart of this, that in fact, there isn't just one 
cultural story that is monogamy. Here's the one rule to rule them it's all. It's a pretty big topic to like narrow down to one and, single thing that works. And when we get right down to it, all of us individuals are in relationship. We're all just us doing yeah. relating. And we all have different histories and backgrounds that lead us to have a set of understandings and beliefs about the world and how things work. And we have to we have to actually discuss and describe what are we talking about when we're making our relationship, even if we're doing what is generally accepted to be like typical practice. Yeah. Something that it behooves I, all of us to be conscious and have these discussions. To be conscious and, and to look at the things, something that I have heard you say a, a lot about in um, talking about relationships is imagination. Um, so the, the imagination, first of all, the imagination that the the one script in in whatever realm is is what there is, and not imagining beyond that makes it difficult to look at the thing itself. That's a great point. So, yeah, I have a thing about the idea that um, our relationship is limited to <laughs> what we can imagine the relationship to be. Right. It's just another version of, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. Once you understand the vast variety of relational options there are, you can cr custom create something that's right for you. And I start from a place of, well, let's imagine what might be possible. Um, and so I've explored it from that place. One of the things that came up right away for us was, okay, um, if we're not going to be monogamous, and we were both married to other people when this first came up, um, and if if monogamy is no longer like the general story, what are we doing? Right away, we ran up against imagination barriers. Yep. Every person involved in that scenario back when that happened in 2009 <laughs> Every one of us had a story, a picture, an imagination of what relationship was supposed to be. And we didn't necessarily have the vocabulary to discuss it and describe it to each other, right. which meant we hurt each other without meaning to. I don't think anybody involved in that situation meant to cause harm, but we were we were at cross crossbars. We, we couldn't quite understand each other. So yeah. let's get some of the vocabulary out on the okay. table. Good. Um, so monogamy, we're talking about fidelity at that point. We're talking about sharing our sexual, romantic, emotional uh, stuff with one person in general when we're talking about monogamy. But everybody does it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, some people have a monogamy that includes a don't ask, don't tell policy, which I had actually never heard of until a decade ago. But some people absolutely consider themselves monogamous, but they would never talk about whatever happens, say, on a business trip. Okay. That would just never come up. So this isn't a consciously like crafted, hey, let's have a don't ask, don't tell policy, but just a, this is just an understanding that we both have. And I, I've seen this um, in client work as well, where people are like, nope, I don't, I don't want to know what I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's very different from what we do. Um, some people have a monogamish relation relationship. The word monogamish, um, it it was first coined by Dan Savage, oh, a while ago now. Um, and monogamish, I think you just looked it up. What what's it really? It's um, so my understanding of it is that so sure there's there's these two people and they are they are monogamous and they have all those fidelity agreements and everything, but. If somebody does if something, one or the other of them, one or the other of them has a, a dalliance, a fling, an affair, a flame. Yeah, um, that it's not a deal breaker. It's not the end of the world. Now there's a conversation to be had, and it had, and it could be a very intense conversation. But my understanding of it was that there isn't this like line around it that says that is we're now we're done it's like okay now we dig into that and see what's happening and it could be from the side of well that's annoying all the way to um okay we got to sit down for a while that's we got to sit down for a while and 
often mm. with a counselor. With or, a counselor. Yeah, with somebody who can help navigate a, yeah. a renegotiation. And so that's monogamish. Then we we can move into swinging. Swinging comes up in conversations about open relating to. Swinging, that is a hysterical term. It left is. over from, I think, the 70s, 60s. I'm not sure. I but, you know, it calls to mind old pictures of key parties with everybody's keys in a bowl and, and splitting them up and a whole lot of cocaine. and <laughs> Mustaches somehow mustaches comes to mind come to for mind, me. It's right? all 70s, I'm thinking. Except swinging <laughs> is still a thing that happens yeah. and works very well for lots of people. Swinging tends to revolve around a, a monogamous imagination still where the, the couple still is has a lot of the rule setting happens around what the couple sets up for themselves mm -hmm. so there may be sexual swapping there may be um soft swapping or full swapping and these are different ways of describing how much sexual intensity might happen between different pairings of people and, and would you say then that the in in that situation of swinging that it's um it's a, an emotional monogamy or is it something that you just let them define, let people define themselves and it. No, I usually hear it described as um, people will often say falling in love is outside the rules oh. in swinging. Um, and usually if, if somebody has come to me and they're describing like, okay, now I have feelings for someone. Now they're in a real ne renegotiation about, okay, am I actually shifting into some other form of consensual non-monogamy? And we need to renegotiate our agreement because swinging does tend to give primacy to the original agreements of any monogamous dyad. Okay. And so it's really, it's, you might, the term sexual play comes up, play parties, the idea of, of having sexual encounters that are designed to be enjoyable and entertaining, but not designed to create whole new relationships and um, different relationship structures. Whereas now if we shift over into the imagination of um, polyamory, there we're actually giving primacy to the, the alternative structures of relationship. Okay. So then we're talking about things like and no longer just a dyad with, you know, two people, but maybe a triad. But a triad can be structured in multiple ways, too. You might have each person having a relationship with each other person. So you have like a triangle. You might have a V um, or a hinge where each person has a relationship with just one of the people. Um, you might have a quad where everybody's relating to everybody else or where two people are relating to two people, but not to all three people. So the number of relationships right. goes up. You might fast. have a W or a, or a square or a triangle or, yeah. or a constellation. So you start getting into larger numbers of people. And now you can, people describe their, their groups as polycules or as constellations. The point of all of those relationship structures is to just try to give us some vocabulary to talk about what it is that we're doing when we're talking about polyamory because this is where the imagination becomes important again to me it's about stretching the imagination of what love is and what it could be what what family structures are and what they could, what they be. could be and it does for some people it really does strain the imagination and i can totally see why it we've grown up in a culture that really doesn't it just doesn't have an imaginal realm for for things beyond the dyad. Even though lots of people grow up in households with one parent or two different households with two different sets of parents or grandparents or what, we do have variation, but we tend to draw the line for some reason around the the triad or the quad raising their family together or um, a whole big group of people who have all different relationships and who have different dynamics that we don't even have words for, but maybe they have a word for it themselves. The important point there, I think, is just that people are designing all sorts yeah. of types of relationship structures, and, and they'll always have to come back to getting on, a sh on the same page about having some sort of shared vocabulary about how they talk about their relationship, and then we can all do each other a favor by just saying, hey, you know what? Monogamy is not the only way that relating happens. 
So let's just have an open mind about the other things that exist. Which allows us to have conversations about Conversations, right. And learn from each other, regardless of whether we Mm -hmm. want to have these other kinds of relationships. Something that, a, a word that I have found really, really helpful in trying to talk about my relationships more mindfully is um, hierarchies. The word hierarchy when we're talking about relationships. So if you have just two people in a monogamous relationship, then there's a there's a strong push these days for most of us to have an, an equal or equitable relationship. A, there's there's a lot of that. Okay. And yet as soon as you add another another person to this mix you start hearing words like primary partner secondary partner or anchor partner or nesting partner and right away we're pulled into what the heck does any of that mean exactly and the first rule of open relating i think is ask whoever you're talking to to define what they mean Because even when I sit in a room full of people who've been practicing open relating for a long time, it is really common for us to describe and define things in slightly different ways. So So, we've got to ask. So in our relationship, you and I, um, which we have characterized as open. Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. So hierarchy this isn't scripted by the way no this is the first time i've asked this question <laughs> well we have talked about this we've but only I'm not... talked about it but we i've never actually just said what do you mean okay what it means for me what it means for you i believe that we have a descriptive hierarchy but not a prescriptive one okay and here's how i see that playing out and i i think i first heard this maybe from somebody at poly uh, at philly poly Ah, there's a great polyamorous community in Philadelphia. And I think I heard this first there. Um, It's the idea that, well, we live together. We raise our children together. We share a house. We share finances. So there are a number of things that mean that there there are things that we have to do together and obligations that we've made to each other that become part of the description of how our relationship works. And Mm. yet, just because I I have my name on your checkbook and vice versa, doesn't mean that my feelings are more important than any other partner you have. So, I've been a secondary. I've been described as a secondary. And while sometimes I have taken that label willingly, I've also had it thrust upon me. Mm. And the thing that was thrust upon me was the idea that my feelings needed to be secondary. I see the difference there. Yeah. It was so challenging because what it felt like is I needed to remember that your couplehood came first and my feelings were secondary. And I'm not talking about just like um, a sexual escapade like say um a threesome where you know so if i have sex with a couple and i'm the unicorn in that situation um i am a bisexual woman who enjoys having sex with couples if i'm doing that i go into that expecting there to be a certain dynamic where their their fidelity agreement is already intact and i'm being invited in to that and that's all laid out What I'm talking about in answer to your question is different. It's about the whole spirit of the relationship and whether you can really be open and be ethical when you're willing to put some, a primary partner's wants above a secondary partner's needs. And this gets really messy because how, who gets to decide what's a want and what's a need and where does manipulation come into all of that? And I, I don't mean to say that this is easy at all, but I spent a lot of time thinking about it. It's not simple, but I think that for me, when I've when I've tried to just say, let's not do hierarchy at all, all I'm doing is fooling myself. Now, I don't know whether other people can do this well. I've been just fooling myself that I would be okay with being second in feelings. And that hasn't worked for me. Do you feel like maybe, do you feel like 
uh, a a static hierarchy would be different from a dynamic hierarchy where like people's place move around. And I say this because I'm thinking about here we are, we live together in a yeah. house with children. Sometimes I push a, aside your wants for a kid. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And, for somebody and, else's needs. Absolutely. And so if, if those things bubble up and move around and, and we can, we can shift. So I, I think it would, it would make a difference when when everybody's living together and they're shifting back and forth mm -hmm. um, according to need and and just the situation. Like in context, I think that matters. Um, I think having it predetermined was yeah. the thing that was so challenging to me. Um, and I think that well, the I think one of the first things I was told by an established person who was doing. Um, polyamory for years and years and years one of the first true things i ever heard was if you are entering into consensual non-monogamy just expect that you won't necessarily your primary partner won't necessarily be your primary partner forever now a lot of people panic when they hear that i actually found it very calming i actually felt a calmness come over me when that happened i was in Seattle at the time we were traveling and I heard that and I thought, Oh, you know what? That feels like the same calm. I feel when I think about allowing myself the permission to leave you, if you became harmful to me hmm. or accepting the fact that death will indeed one day part us. It feels like just accepting part of what life is. It doesn't mean that we will not be together. It means that the false sense of sureness that I had built everything on before, that the, the illusory part of that could be pushed aside for me to say, oh, no, enjoy the fuck out of every day because you don't really know what tomorrow brings. Yeah. And that so I felt calm and I was able to re-engage in our particular dynamic much more strongly after that thinking, okay, yeah, this is a little riskier, but I'm not sure it's practically speaking any riskier than any other life. It's just really evident <laughs> that there is risk. Uh, and, the risk is, is visible. And you are a big fan of uh, visible versus invisible. Yeah, that being able to strange. see things that that helps you, and I, yeah. So, so you've talked about your your imagination of open relationship, and I was just reading about um, the in uh you were reading book building just, open relationships building open relationships. By Dr. thank Liz, you Liz yep. Powell. and the chapter on uh, that that just love styles like lays them all out yep, yeah lays them all out and you asked me about monogamish and that's where i had read about it and um there's the the organization and classification of it is really interesting and i'm not sure exactly where i fall in that well so Right away, though, that's super interesting. You and I, independently of each other, came to the conclusion that we were each sort of endemically polyamorous. Like, I remember having a conversation with you com completely separately. I came home from a training and I was like, you know what I think I figured out today? I think being polyamorous is just part of my identity. I think mm. it's l l sort of like an orientation for me. I don't know. So, which meant for me, I could behave monogamously. That's not a problem. I don't have any trouble behaving monogamously, um, uh, making an agreement and then following through on it. But, but I fall in love a lot, like really easily. Okay. And so, if the if the agreement is that I won't have feelings for anyone else. Yeah, we're not going to be wow, I don't having know. that agreement. But I just don't know how to do it. And when I yeah. realized that, I was like, oh, I think this is just part of me. Now, what I bet, what I agree to do behavior-wise is separate. Now, you had actually come to me. Like, 
you originally appeared in my romantic imagination as a person who was like, well, I don't really, we don't really do monogamy. We do something else. But you didn't have a descriptive for no, it. No, not at all. You I, just knew you weren't doing I, the general cultural script. It's the reason non -mono the, the phrase non-monogamy works for me. It's like, well, I don't know what I'm doing, but it's not that. Right. And so I, I don't really like describing... Uh, non-monogamy is non-monogamy because I don't like positing I don't like it defining as, things like, as the a polar negative. opposite yeah. of monogamy because I don't think it is. I I've well, done the research. It just isn't. Yeah. It, polyamory and monogamy are not opposite ends of a pole. There's a great set of papers by um, oh Ferrer, the the researcher Ferrer, um, where he he talks about the poly mono wars and how they're posed as opposites, but they're really not opposites. And I have written a paper about this where I I, I posit the existence of a polyimaginal realm of relationship where monogamy is just one of the many experiences that exist in all the different ways we can relate to people. That rings true to me. I can choose my behavior at any given point, but I love really big and widely and that works for me and so having the label of polyamorous just feels appropriate to me um, and it doesn't feel like it has anything to do with whether or not I'm having any sexual or emotional or romantic relationships with other people um, that actually feels like just mostly logistics <laughs> Logistics issues. Logistics, but totally. the, the core of it feels like I it sits right in me. And you, so you described to me doing not monogamy as sort of, well, I don't know, but I don't want to be like, like, I, I don't know. I'm just not doing that general married thing. And I, I did like push back at the idea of having marriage prescripted for me. Like, it's like this. Yeah. And I pushed back at that idea and said, well, does that work? And you've, you mentioned that about, about the imagination and the intentionality, like, okay, look at it, whatever it is you're doing, relationships, uh, playing piano, cooking, whatever, look at it. Is it, is it doing what you want to do? Are you getting out of it what you want to get out of it? And um, you started talking with me about that right away in our relationship. And it has been very beneficial to me. And so looking at, yeah, well, what do I want to be doing? So in other words, we, so we've created a consensual non-monogamy that works for us. And while we've chosen most of the time to use the label polyamory, because it seems to work for us, we, we both like it more or less, but really it's unique to us. And when there's been, when there have been other people involved, all of a sudden that opens up the conversation. What exactly are we doing? We have to define our terms again. We have to come back to that that central idea of defining our terms so that we're all sharing enough vocabulary to have meaningful conversation because without that, we fall into not just a cultural script, but the script that lives in our head. And that has to do with playing out, yeah. you know, the relationships we witnessed as children, the our idealized rom-com relationships yeah. and all of that and has very little to do with, am I creating the love that I want? Am I actively, am I love as a verb, actively creating the love I want? And that's what I want to see more of in the world. Yeah. I care far less about what people call it or even what specific behavior they're partaking in. And Which just I, let's make, let's make love work. Let's make love work. And I think that having conversations with the people that you love about what works is a big step toward that. So this was actually a problem um, this was a problem when I was first posing my research question, uh, which wound up being about how jealousy is experienced by polyamorous individuals. Mm -hmm. um, that's my my doctoral research question. When I was posing it, one of my advisors said, so don't those relationships not, they just don't work. And I was like, okay, let's address that. What do you mean by it oh. doesn't work? So if we aren't having conversations that describe exactly what we mean when we say, I want a relationship that works, we're leaving a lot on the table. Yeah. And so I don't think it's about which kind of relationship you have. I think this is about just describing how you want it to work. Yeah. Because if we're going to define monogamy 
as being sexual, emotional, and romantic fidelity to one person for your whole life, then that's not happening a lot either, right? It's just more complicated than that. Cheating happens. Um, people get remarried, people get divorced, people have affairs and then reconcile, people divorce each other and then marry again. It's, it's complicated. A complicated mess. <laughs> right? So we can't we can't be reductive and say that never works without saying, what does it mean for something it, to work? And if we don't define what work is ourselves, someone else will. Right. So what does it mean for something to work exactly? What does it mean for our relationship what to work? What does it mean for our <laughs> Again, relationship? not scripted. So, Ken, what does it mean for uh, our relationship yeah. to work? Um, well, I it, it's important to me that you um, see me. And mm -hmm. uh, this is vague, I know, but... Um, that that you see me as i am and that i can let myself be who i am in a moment and then that you will respond authentically and sometimes that's extremely uncomfortable but i would so totally never trade that for somebody who made it easy but didn't show me what was really going on so for me what does it mean to work it means that our two authentic selves stand next to each other and bump up against each other and have incredibly intimate times and fights and arguments and conflict and times when we're disconnected and disconnect. But then to know that, yes, but it was a disconnect born of where we both actually were in that moment. So that's what we're working means to me. I'll take it. I'll sign up. I'll, I'll commit to that. Awesome. That works for me. You know why it works for me is the only thing I was just talking to Angela on claim the stage about this, my, my truth, my core value is honesty. And so showing up authentically matters to me so much more than <laughs> right, really anything else. I want to be kind in this life, but I don't care whether I'm nice. Mm. I care about being authentic and kind, and I, I, I've been working on my, my, my softness so that I can approach people without that brashness that I was known for in my 20s and 30s. But it matters to me that you see value in that authentic well, connection, even when it's not yummy and fun and all smooshed together. There is a story that I have been brought up with and lived with my life that was getting through my life that was given to me that is... Um, somebody else's um, painful feelings about something that I have done uh, is is somehow like a, an attack on me. Oh. Is somehow a, an injury again. to me that, Say that again. someone else's pain, someone else's if painful feels... feelings about something I have done. Mm -hmm. If they express them to me, that I am somehow being attacked. Okay, so let's give an example because this has come up a lot. And I think resolving this, getting to a new spot mm. has been very helpful for us. Yep. In open relating, sometimes we bang up against each other. Yep. And sometimes that means that you hurt me or I hurt you. And so let's just focus on when when you have hurt me because it, it plays out in this. Yep. So there was a time when you did not attend to my aftercare. Yes. We went out, we played at a party. It was awesome. We had a great time, but I had a very intense experience. And I was not there for you, you when it was over. were not there for me. And we had an arrangement, an agreement, an explicit mm -hmm. agreement that you would be. That I did not and, hold up my end of. Yep, because you were, you were in your own head. Like Later, I found out you were in your own head. You were dealing with your own stuff. And rather than pile that on me, you were just holding your own stuff, which meant I was withdrawn was from withdrawn. the thing that I right. said I would do for you. And without checking in. Without any communication about it, yeah. And what happened was I brought, like, after a day or two of processing, I brought this to you. And I was like, here, ouch, this really, really hurt. Mm -hmm. And we had an agreement. You, you didn't uphold your agreement. It really, really hurt. And I have some... I have some stuff to work out now, including some some trust that I feel like was broken and also just ouch, some big ouch, and I feel alone. And you took that so seriously. You 
but not like in a good way. Not in a good way. No, no. <laughs> I took it as seriously as, but my ego, it hurts. Yeah. Now we have to deal with that. So not your pain. My I had pain. this Oof. great big ouch. Yeah. And you, your response, your immediate and lasting response during that particular time was yeah. to to feel bad for yourself that you had hurt me. Yeah. And then to yes. in implicit ways, not explicit ways, in implicit ways, ask me, request me, require me to take care of your feelings yep. for having told you that you had violated an agreement and had hurt me. This got really tangled really fast. And this is what I mean when I say it takes a lot of communication yes. to do this stuff with any sort of... There were many, many words to work that out because um, you're... I had to find a way to get past my feelings about having hurt you so that I could um, be present for you in your pain that I had caused. And now I would say that that was about you developing a window of tolerance for hearing that you had done something wrong. I agree with that. You that you had violated your, you were out of integrity with yourself. Oh yes, which hurt also. And then, yeah. yeah. And you hadn't, the window of tolerance really hadn't opened up very wide. It was, it was like a crack open and that's yeah. it. And so every time you were presented with a, hey, that was an ouch, it was, it was mm -hmm. a return of all this stuff. And the reason I think this all fits into the into this conversation about what exactly open relating styles are is this is ours. Right. Ours yeah. involves a whole lot of words. It involves lots of conversations about what relationships even are and sort of rediscovering all the time who e each of mm -hmm. us is and who we are in relationship to other people. None of and, it's been simple, but that to me defines working. Yeah. Like if I had to describe like, what does it mean for a relationship to work? Yeah, I'll, I can co-sign on, it means we can be our authentic selves. And I've had to let go of the idea that that means we'd be comfortable. Yep. Luckily I wasn't super attached to that one anyways. And embrace the idea that it relationships for me, in my book, are a relationship accelerator. I'm there. I'm sorry. They're an individuation accelerator. Relationships are oh. an individuation accelerator. So individuation being the process of becoming more and more in full connection and integration of myself. Capital S self. My 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 authentic and true self. The part of me that is not just a wounded child. The part of me that is. Uh, well, Richard Schwartz, Schwartz would say the the undamaged whole, or Jung would say that 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 spiritual center point that is both within and without. It's it's divine. When when I'm in relationship to someone else, I'm experiencing an opportunity, for better or for worse, <laughs> to observe myself individuating, going through the pains of growth, um, moving away, trying to hide from growth, yeah, avoiding it's... avoiding the dark corners, avoiding my shadow, avoiding my work with the with the other, the capital O other. So you by deciding to engage at this particular in this particular way with me, you have provided me this crucible, this alchemical vessel to experience my path of individuation. And if you withdrew from that, I would still have this vessel. I would still be here in this vessel, um, co-created in, in this relationship. Like you, you've become an integral part of my individuation process. And that to me is the real entanglement of two souls, regardless of how many other people are in the picture. Yep. That's the entanglement. I love that. And it's different from the entanglement of like, getting on the relationship escalator and like, okay, let's get ourselves closer and closer and closer together until we're tightly bound and obligated to each other to the nth degree. Like that's one way to do relationships. This thing I'm talking about is something else. It's, it's not better than it's not worse than, but it is a little bit different. Yeah. It is the thing that we do, you and I. And I'm sure there are lots of other people out here hearing this and saying, 
that sounds familiar, but I hadn't yeah. necessarily put words to yeah. it. Or maybe you have, and if you have better words or different words, I would love to hear them. Yeah. So if you have feedback on this episode or you just want to talk about this, I would totally love to hear your thoughts. You can email me at jolie at joliehamilton.com and just, yeah, let me know. How do you do this thing called relationship? The conversations available among us all about how we do this can only benefit us all. Yeah. Yeah. So, and if you have questions about this or this piques your interest in a particular part of what relating is, whether that is um, open relating or just relating in general or about monogamy for that matter, because goodness knows I've done plenty of years of that myself, um, pose those questions because that's a jumping off point for these conversations. So this was our longest episode yet. And it's very late at night. We're doing this last minute because life has been really, really wild. And I just want to say thank you because it it's so hard sometimes to think about having another big conversation, another big, big meaty conversation. And it's like 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. And, <laughs> and thank you for having your day and then doing this. I'm always surprised at how much energy Mm -hmm. I get out of this. Me too. This is the proof that I'm an extrovert. So much energy out of this. Well, I don't know what that's proof of for me then, because I thought I was an <laughs> introvert, but this is energizing. And and I do, I would love to hear from people about their thoughts about all of this. Yeah. And if you if you email me, Jolie at JolieHamilton.com, and, and you put his name on it, I'll send it right to him. Maybe we'll get you your own address. <gasps> you could have your own address. I could. That's not just... Oh see all these things we can do. Thanks for listening, everybody. And yeah, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to jolie at joliehamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the entrepreneur's action plan for passionate, sustainable love, is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.